Great, so let's get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Bid Evaluation Masterclass Mentor Advisory Forum today. My name is Carrie Leoje, and I'm the Skills Development Manager here at the Kelowna office of Women's Enterprise Center. Uh, we also have offices in Victoria and Vancouver, and we serve women entrepreneurs across the province. And in my role here, I oversee all of our training programs, uh, such as forums like this, uh, live workshops, and other webinars as well. And we're always looking for your feedback on content that you're looking for to help you support um, that as you're growing your business. So please be sure to watch for our follow-up email and share feedback on anything we can support you with. And how we do that, supporting you across the province, we provide business loans of up to $150,000, we offer professional advice and resources through our business advisory team, skills training, mentoring program. So we have one-to-one -one mentoring, peer mentoring, and the taking the stage programs. Uh, and then also just the su supportive community through forums, events, webinars, et cetera, that we host. So be sure to sign up for our e-news and e-blasts uh, if you haven't already on our website, because that's how we get most of that information out and into your hands. And we're funded by the federal government through Western Economic Diversification as part of the Women's Enterprise Initiative, which includes very similar organizations in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. So of course you can learn all about us and the programs at WEC.ca. So today, today's sessions, I'm pleased to have with me Erin Eidenberg from uh, the Office of Small and Medium Enterprises Pacific, who is a project officer. And today, Erin's going to run through a fictional evaluation process so we can really see what it looks like. Uh, we're going to learn some common mistakes that bidders make, how to avoid them, how and when to ask questions, and best practices for creating our own bids. So welcome, Erin. Thank you very okay. much. Can you, uh, can you all hear me? I can hear you great, and I'm going to let you take over the screen share as well. Right on. I'm taking over. We'll share. Yeah, just takes a second. Presentation. So you should be able to see the cover page of Bid Evaluation Masterclass. Is that uh, is that correct? I don't see it yet. Um. I'm just going to jump on Danielle. Maybe you can hop on the. Oh, I, I just I just needed to click one more button. Sorry. Perfect. My bad. There we go. Oh, now. Yep, I'm seeing your How screen and now? you're starting the presentation. That looks great. Okay, terrific. Sorry about and that. Thanks very much. <laughs> and we're off. So uh, yeah, hello and welcome. My name is Aaron Eidenberg. I'm uh, I'm with the Office of Small and Medium Enterprises, and thanks for joining me today uh, for the online version of the Bid Evaluation Masterclass. So um, so this session is designed primarily for audiences who have had some exposure to uh, to a, a government procurement process, have bid on some, some opportunities in the past, or have attended uh, some of our seminars um, in the past. If you haven't done those things, don't worry. Um, we'll, we'll cover what you need to know. Uh, so my office, the Office of Small and Medium Enterprises, was designed to help navigate small and medium enterprises through our federal procurement process. There's a recognition that it's big and heavy and uh, can be difficult to understand, especially for small businesses. Um, even just reading through, you know, one of our 60 page RFP documents, if it's, if it's just you and a partner in your business or, you know, just a few employees, uh, that can be a real significant drain on the amount of time and resources that you have in a given week. Uh, and frankly, that's a barrier to you, uh, to you competing along with uh, the other companies. So, so we try and help reduce that time. We try and help understand how these processes work as quickly as we can. We do that through engaging, assisting, and informing uh, small businesses on how our process works. So uh, that's, that's really what we're doing today. Um, we're going to try and take an inside look. The more that the, the hope here is that the more that you understand about how we run our processes, that can help you be strategic when you approach uh, one of our bidding scenarios in the future. We also have this fourth function to, re to help reduce barriers. That's really where I want to hear from you. So I just want to say that the conversation doesn't end today. 
Uh, Kara Lee, I'm sure will share my contact details. My, uh, it's in my presentation as well here. Um, and I'll put it in the chat as well. So if anybody has any questions and wants to discuss things afterwards, more than happy to do that. Um, yeah, so, so contracting with the federal government um, is not the same as uh, doing business with another uh, business entity directly. There's a number, uh, there's a number of laws, regulations, uh, uh, policies that guide our procurement process and that can make it kind of difficult um, for businesses to engage with us. Um, my department, PSPC, we really are the main procurement arm of the federal government. I like to think of us a little bit as the business arm of the government too. Um, tends to be any sort of common business function that any department might need uh, gets consolidated at, at PSPC. Uh, so we do some common real estate functions, we do some common IT functions, we do procurement on behalf of all the other departments, and that's really what we're talking about today. Um, and then this middle point, and I'm going to say these words again and again and again throughout our hour together today. Uh, it's important that all procurement activities be conducted in a way that is open, fair, and transparent. Um, point is that all suppliers have an equal chance of doing business with us. Uh, I've heard it said, and I really like uh, the way of saying that it's the process that will select a winner. It is not any any given person. Um, so remember that as we go through the the sort of exercise that we're going to do today. That that stick with the process, and the process that is going to select um, our winner. So today, what are we going to be doing? So today, uh, you're gonna go through a short exercise which mirrors the process uh, that we use, that the federal government used to select a winning bid in a competitive process. Um, so at, at our office, we spend a great deal of our time uh, trying to take your point of view to understand your perspective and the barriers that you face when you're participating in our process. And we realized that one of the ways we could help our potential suppliers best is by giving you the opportunity to take our perspective to take the perspective of the people who are going to be evaluating your bid. So that's the goal of today's session. Uh, the more you can understand about our responsibilities, our responsibilities with respect to fairness, openness, and transparency, uh, the better equipped that you will be to move efficiently through one of our procurement processes and, uh, and strategically spend your precious time and resources where it will matter most when you're actually creating your bid. So today's session, you're gonna act as some contracting officers uh, as the technical authority, uh, you're going to evaluate some bids against some established criteria, and you're going to recommend a contract award to one of the suppliers. And you're going to be doing that in a way that preserves fairness, openness, and transparency, just like uh, we do when we run a process. So the objectives today is that, and Kara Lee talked about this right off the top, uh, you, can, you can understand a little bit about our process, um, learn and then if there's some some specific takeaways you can you can bring uh, into your bids from today's session it's really understanding about mandatory and point rating criteria what the differences between those two things are and, and how to maximize uh, your bids chance based on those uh, the basis of selection so how are we going to actually select a winner and there's a number of different ways that we can do that but the point is that it's got to be transparent we've got to let you know early on what our, uh, what our criteria are and what our rules for the game are gonna be. And finally, the correct way to ask questions during a procurement process and the situations in which you might want to strategically ask the right questions in the right way. Uh, so I, of course, uh, have to take a moment to give a big disclaimer at this point. Um, this is a very simplified example uh, for demonstration purposes only. Um, We've tried to make this scenario mirror as closely as possible, a real solicitation situation, uh, so that when you do find yourselves in a real live bidding scenario, things are gonna look familiar. However, this, what we're gonna go through today is a highly simplified, simplified version, which is gonna focus on some key elements only. So just because it works a certain, I just wanna make sure that everyone understands that just because it works a certain way in today's session does not mean that the, particular, the particulars are gonna be identical in a real tender. Uh, you always have to read the entire solicitation document to be sure you're meeting all the legal requirements um, and are aware of everything you're agreeing to by submitting a bid. All tenders are going to have specific differences in the requirements, whether those are technical, financial, the certifications required, 
Uh, they're gonna have difference in the rules of how we select a winner. Um, but the point, again, the point is that we have to be transparent about that. You've got to make sure that before you submit a bid, you understand exactly what the rules are. Okay, so for today's scenario, you're going to be buying dogs. Uh, so you're imagining that you're working for the Department of Enforcement. This is not a real federal government department. Um, and you need some detector dogs for your program. So these are the same dogs that you might find at an airport or at the border. Um, so it's your job to select the supplier from whom you will purchase these dogs. So you're the end users in our language, the technical authority for the procurement. So you've been working with us, PSPC, the uh, Public Services and Procurement Canada, to define your requirements and the criteria that we'll use for evaluating those requirements. Everything has to be upfront and transparent from the beginning so that all potential suppliers have the same information to work from when submitting their bids. So here's where we are in the process. This is where we are right now, where your role will pick up. Again, this is mirroring the actual tendering process that uh, PSPC and our clients will go through to select a contractor. So we've posted that requirement on buyandsell.gc.ca. I, I assume some of the participants today have been to buyandsell.gc.ca, um, but if you haven't, uh, that's where we post our tenders. That's where we post the opportunities uh, for business with the federal government of Canada. So the solicitation has been advertised up there publicly. Um, and that's the document that I, that I sent out. We'll go through some of those uh, in a moment. Um, but that's where we detail all the requirements, the goods or the services that we're looking to buy, along with all the legal rules for bidding, all the criteria we're going to use to evaluate the bids. Um, the tenders, usually they're online and available for like 40 days and 40 nights before the deadline to submit a bid. Um, where we are in our scenario is that those 40 days have now passed, the solicitation is closed, um, and before the deadline to submit bids, PSPC received three bids from three different companies. We got a bid from the A plus dog trainers, from the Good Boy Doggos, and from the Deutscher Schaeferhund School. So these are three bids uh, that again were, were sent out in, those, uh, in the participant package. Um, we'll have a look at those. If you didn't have a look at them already, don't worry, we're gonna go through them as well today. Um, yeah. So PSBC receives these bids, and what's the first thing that they do? One of the first things they do is split the bids. They split the technical portion from the financial section of each bid. They keep, uh, they, PSPC keeps the financial section and they send the technical portion to you, to the end user, uh, and your, your job then is to evaluate the technical merits of the proposal only. We do that on purpose. That's, we, se we separate them out so that ideas about where your price might lie do not affect any um, judgment on the technical merit of your bid. So a typical tender, We'll have all of these parts to it. And again, if you've, if you've been to buy and sell and you've looked around at some of the bids, uh, these, these sort of sections will look familiar to it, but to you. But um, typically, yeah, they're gonna have you know, six sections of a bunch of legal things that you're agreeing to by submitting a bid before you get to Annex A, which is the statement of work, which is where you're gonna find actually what you are bidding on, uh, the work that you're offering to do for the federal government. So today what we're gonna look at is just three of these sections. We're focusing on these three sections. Uh, obviously everything is important when you're actually bidding um, and needs to be reviewed in depth, but today we're just gonna focus on these three parts. So first of all, the statement of work, which you find in Annex A. This is the actual work you'll be performing um, uh, and, and how we're gonna judge your ability to perform those tasks. Um, the evaluation procedures, so part four, those are the way in which the criteria are gonna to come together to, with the price to form a decision. So that's what we're gonna to work today. The list of work that we're asking for, how we're gonna award points based on that work, the evaluation criteria, and then how all those points are gonna to come together um, to arrive at a decision. So these materials were sent out ahead of today's session. The links are here again for you. Uh, and I just wanna repeat again that um, 
If you haven't gone through these ahead of time, don't worry, we're gonna go through them right now. So first of all, the solicitation documents. Bring that up for us. Okay, the solicitation documents. So you can see there's, we've skipped over parts one, two, and three. Very important in a real bidder. They're gonna tell you where your bid needs to go, how to prepare it. Um, you know, if there's a bidder's conference or anything you need to attend, that might be in these sections, but we're gonna skip right to part four. So the evaluation procedures, how we're gonna select. Uh, bids will be assessed in accordance with the entire requirement of the bid solicitation, including the technical and finance. Basically, we're gonna mark everything that we say here. Um, for the mandatory technical criteria, refer to Annex C. For the point rated technical criteria, refer to Annex C. That's later on in the document. That's what, like we were saying. Annex C. Oh, geez. Annex C is the evaluation criteria. So the basis of selection in this case is lowest price per point. So you've got to be declared responsive, comply with all the requirements of the bid solicitation, meet all mandatory technical evaluation criteria, obtain the minimum. So you got to do all these things in order to be declared responsive. And then the responsive bid with the lowest evaluated price per point will be recommended for award of a contract. So our formula that we're going to be using is the total cost of your bid divided by your total technical score equals a cost per point. And you're going to arrive, and the lowest cost per point is going to be recommended for contract award. There's lots of different formulas that we use. There's no need, to, we don't need to get into the specifics of this formula. This is actually a very simple formula that might be used. Um, we also might award just just strictly based on the lowest uh, the lowest price that is a responsive bid. I'm sure you've seen that scenario in the past as well. The point again is that we can award uh, we can award the contract in any way that we that we choose to, but we've got to make sure we tell you first off, be transparent about it. How are we going to select the winning bid? In this case, we're using lowest price per point, which is a way of combining. Uh, to get best value, combining the technical merit of your bid with a good price. Okay, we've skipped part five and part six, and we go right to Annex A, the statement of work. So here's what we're buying. Department of Enforcement is a requirement to purchase 25 dogs. So there's a bit of background that we provide you on, uh, on the Detector Dog Service Program. And here, now we get into the scope. We need a requirement to purchase 25 dogs delivered to Vancouver, BC on or before. Obviously, I have to change that date. Well, here we go. Requirements, specifications. Dogs must be. That word must is a great indication that these are mandatory criteria. So the dog must be, number one, German Shepherd. Number two, 10 to 24 months in age. Number three, have a weight between 15 and 40 kilograms, and number four, be able to respond to um, a couple simple commands here, sit, lay down, come, and stay. And then secondly, the supplier should have experience in the training of dogs and sold dogs to law enforcement agencies. This word should is a good indication that these are not mandatory criteria, but in fact, they are preferable criteria. They're merit or uh, asset criteria part of the point rated technical score that you're going to achieve. Uh, and then we specify some constraints in delivery. Let's go down to Annex C, the evaluation criteria. So this is what they give us. They give us a nice grid here with the four mandatory technical criteria laid out. It's gotta be German Shepherd, it's gotta be 10 to 24 months old, it's gotta weigh between 15 and 40 kilograms, and it's gotta be able to do these commands. And all you gotta do is indicate whether you're compliant. These are mandatory technical criteria. It's a simple yes or no, you either have it or you don't. And then the point rated technical criteria. So to be considered compliant, you have to get a minimum of five out of 20 on these two questions. And here they are. So we want to know your number of months of experience training canine dogs. And we've given the way the points lay out based on how many months of experience you have. And secondly, the number of dogs that you sold to law enforcement. So the number of dogs here and how the points lay out. 
we won't always provide a really nice um, table like this, evaluation table like this in Annex C, uh, but when we do, it's a real good indication to you of how the best, uh, what the best way might be to structure your bid. Okay, so those are the three sections we're gonna look at today. And again, here they are. Uh, you can find them in this link here. Uh, and now we'll go through the bids from the three, uh, the three bidders, the A plus dog trainers, the good boy doggos, the Deutsche Schaeferhund School, uh, criteria by criteria. So we're gonna, we're gonna go through, perform an evaluation of the mandatory and the point rated criteria using Annex C. Uh, we provided you, I've provided you as well with, um, with a worksheet that you can use uh, if you want to, to go through uh, along with me as we go through each criteria and fill this out. Again, no requirement. I'm not going to be collecting these or anything. Um, it's just for your own learning. Um, but if you want to go through and mark along as we go, you can use the worksheet. Uh, we're going to participate in a consensus meeting. And again, this is going to be tough via web, um, but the point is, again, to mirror our process. Consensus meeting is very important. We don't take, a value, take an average of the values that have been awarded. We've got to make sure that everybody agrees. So if, if one evaluator gives it an, an 8 out of 10 and another evaluator gives it a 10 out of 10, we don't just say, okay, let's take the average and say they get 9 out of 10. We've got them, those two people have to debate with each other basically until one of them changes their opinion and they arrive at uh, eight or 10, or they both change their opinion and they get a different score. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna man make sure that we all have consensus and that we all agree. Um, and then finally, we're gonna apply the formula that's in part four, the evaluation procedures to select the winning compliant bid and recommend it for contract award. So the criteria that we're dealing with, once again, number one, we got a German Shepherd breed. Number two, uh, they're, they're a specific age. Number three, a uh, specific size. And number four, they can do a couple commands. Okay, so let's go through those mandatory technical criteria bid by bid now. So they've all filled out that same grid. And if we look at their bids here, the first bidder provided us with a cover sheet. Here's their bid. We've got a nice table of contents, a nice introduction here. So here, all they've done is copied the mandatory technical criteria grid and indicated, yes, they're compliant with each of them and then provided a description and reference page in their bid where you can read more about it. So just, just as, a, as an aside, this is a great uh, a structure for your own bid. I always get asked if we provide templates uh, for our bids. We don't, um, but, but these sample bids are a great place to start. So let's go and check out what they actually wrote in here. A-plus is proposing the Belgian Malinois dog. So they're proposing a different kind of dog. And they're, they're, they're saying in here um, that it's a primi primarily and it's being used uh, as the dog of choice for law enforcement agencies all across the world. So they're, they're actually proposing what they think is a better dog. And they've got some description here about the breeding techniques. They're all between, yeah, they're all gonna be between that age. They're all gonna be between that weight. And yet they all, uh, they all can meet uh, respond to the commands listed under this criteria. So what I'm going to do now is make the poll, the first poll live for us today. So we've got a poll up there now for which bids are compliant. So we've got three bidders. We've got the A plus dog training. They've said, yeah, they're compliant with the German Shepherd breed, but they're proposing a, a better dog. We've got the good boy doggos. They've clicked that, yes, they're compliant, but they haven't provided a reference at all. And we've got the Deutscher Schieferhound School, which has clicked, yes, 
they're responsive and then they uh, they don't provide a reference but they just fill out the box and say that yep uh, we specialize in breeding German Shepherd dogs and all German Shepherd, uh, all the dogs will be German Shepherds. So let's just go through all the mandatory criteria. Um, there's four of them again and say which of these, uh, when we get to the end, we'll decide which uh, met all four criteria and were therefore compliant. Okay, the second criteria all 10 to 24 months of age, A plus dog training again. They said yes, and they provided the reference page. They wrote in, we pride ourselves on our breeding techniques, um, raising our dogs in the most humane and health conscious way. I don't really know what that has to do with the age of a dog, but it's nice to know. Um, they provide some vaccination records. Okay, interesting. Again, doesn't really have to do anything with the age of the dog. And then finally, they say the dogs proposed in this bit are the age of 10 to 24 months. That fits our criteria. The good boy doggos, they've said, yep, uh, they're, they are compliant with no reference. And the Deutsche Schäferhund School has again said, yeah, all our dogs are gonna be 10 to 11 months old. That fits it within the criteria of 10 to 24 months old. So they've indicated that yes, they are compliant. The weight, again, this is the, they've used the same strategies. Yes, with a reference. Just click yes with no reference and click yes. Um, with a brief written reference. And finally, able to appropriately demonstrate and respond to the command, sit, lay down, come and stay. Once again, all the same uh, strategies here uh, with the reference and they wrote out here specifically that the dogs proposed in this bid will respond to all commands listed under this criteria. And good boy doggos um, said, yep, with no reference. Deutsche Schaefer Hunt School um, said, yep. And they've provided here a little reference that just says all dogs will know basic puppy commands. And they provided a YouTube link, um, presumably to a video that, that might show the dogs responding uh, to those commands. Who knows? So which bids were compliant? So I'd see, I see lots of people participating in the poll right now. That's awesome, thank you very much. We got five votes for the A plus dog trainers. We got three for good boy doggos. And we got four for Deutsche Schaefer Hunt School. Okay, so I'm gonna go back here to the first criteria. We've had a lot of people say that, yep, the A plus dog trainers are compliant. In fact, they're not. They've proposed an alternative good. They've proposed a different breed of dog than German Shepherds. Uh, they, they claim they function back better as a detector dog uh, than German Shepherds, but should we be accepting this? And the answer is no, we actually cannot accept this because it was listed as a mandatory criteria that only German Shepherds will be accepted. So if, if A plus dog training submits for this other kind of dog, we can't just say, oh, these dogs are gonna be better and accept that bid. That wouldn't be transparent. We have to ensure fairness to all other suppliers around. Maybe there's some other suppliers out there who also breed these Belgian Malinois dogs or any other breed for that matter. And they wanted to bid, but they decided not to because they couldn't meet, they didn't have German Shepherds. So they decided they couldn't meet this bid. Um, are there any questions about that? I think that goes back, Aaron, to when you were saying there's some of the mandatory criteria and some of the suggested, and just making sure you notice the difference in that request for bid. Exactly. When, yeah. When we use those words like must, will, shall, those are mandatory criteria, and there's, there's, it, it means that we have to, have to, have to have it in place, or we cannot declare your your bid responsive, even if it's a better, even if it's a better. Uh, um, even if it's a better good or service than what we've asked for, if it doesn't meet the mandatory criteria, we can't accept it in the way that A-plus dog training has done it here. And this is an important uh, point as well, that the way A-plus dog training has gone about this is simply submitted a bid saying, we've got a better product. We think uh, you should accept that instead of what you've listed as a mandatory. There is a better way they could have done this. Does anyone have an idea what that might have been? And you can use the chat so for the, that. The, the, yeah. 
because our, our participants are muted. So if everybody can see the chat. Yeah, see the chat. yeah. yeah right. Yeah, so it's we have the, um, the more button as well, if you can't see that chat icon with the, the three dots. Perfect. The answer okay. is that, well, I got a chat response right on. Perfect, yeah. So the answer is that if, if they wanted to, in, if they wanted to have the criteria changed, if they wanted to challenge those criteria, there is an opportunity to do that, but you can't just do it in your bid and su submit it on closing date. You've got to ask a question early. Um, and the question that H A plus dog trainers might have asked in this scenario is, are you willing to accept Belgian Malinois dogs? Uh, they're increasingly preferred over German Shepherds by law enforcement agencies, and then give all the reasons why you think they do better, um, and provide the opportunity for the contracting officer to change the criteria. They can't change it once it's once the whole process is closed, but they can change it while it's still open. When I talk to my colleagues uh, upstairs in our contracting office here, how often they change criteria based on questions from suppliers, the answer they give me is that they do it all the time. I think a lot of suppliers feel like they can't ask questions, feel like they shouldn't be challenging our criteria, feel like it might get, get them put on a blacklist or something like that. The fact is suppliers are the expert, we're the contractors. We don't necessarily know that there's this other kind of dog out there that might be better for law enforcement and we want your expertise. So there's always the opportunity to ask questions, there's always the opportunity to challenge criteria but the way in our scenario, A plus dog training has gone about this would get them excluded from the process right away. They could have asked in advance. Exactly, Michelle, thank you. Um, good boy doggos, they are actually completely compliant on all of the criteria. They've, they've done it very simply. They've just checked the box to indicate that, yeah, we're compliant. Um, but in fact, that's all that's really required. And the Deutsche, the Deutsche Schäferhund School, they've done the same thing. They've said, yeah, we're compliant. We breed German Shepherd's dogs. Yeah, we're compliant. They're all between 10 and 11 months. Yeah, we're compliant. They're all between 15 and 20 kilograms. But this criteria, does anyone see any issue with this response here where they just say, yeah, all dogs will know basic puppy commands. And they provided a YouTube link here. We had five out of, five out of 10 people voted that, yeah, they were compliant. So this, this is actually, uh, it's not clear if the puppy commands meet the criteria. That's exactly correct, Fiona. Uh, they've used some vague language here and they've used a YouTube link, um, which is, it's debatable whether we would ever even follow that link. The principle here is that we can only evaluate the information that is contained in your bid. We can't evaluate anything else. It doesn't matter if the technical authority in this case knows that these dogs can all sit, lay down, come and stay. What they've written is basic puppy commands. What are basic puppy commands? That's vague. It does not address the fact that they sit, lay down, come and stay the same way that you can see A plus dog training. They specified all commands listed under this criteria. Basic puppy commands is, uh, is vague and you can, and. Uh, it's interesting as well that this would trigger a conversation among my colleagues about whether or not to accept this versus the good boy doggos who did nothing but check the box and didn't provide any additional information. This would be, get accepted very easily. Uh, this vague language would cause uh, potentially a big debate among my colleagues about whether or not to accept this criteria. So Aaron, can you just clarify, you said that external link wouldn't be clicked and used. So does that mean throughout if you're, you know, trying to save space, energy, time on your proposal, if you're putting links to like view it on our website here, view it on our website here, that's going to be cause for concern. Yeah, that's that's not a great strategy to okay. use when bidding on on our things. It's I know there's a there's a big, um, you know, philosophy about there out there about less is more like. I've, I've been to lots of workshops where they say if your resume is more than one page, you're, you're, not, you know, you're, you're not even going to get looked at in the private sector. Um, that's really not the case with, uh, with federal 
opportunities, whether or not you're bidding on a job um, or bidding on a contract. Uh, more really is more. You got to make it easy to read and easy to understand, but right. uh, you're always best to err on the side of providing um, all the information actually in your bid rather than assuming that somebody knows what you're talking about or assume that they will go to your website. We're actually forbidden from taking into account any other information other than what is contained in your bid. Great. Okay. That's good to know. Perfect. Okay. So, so I think we have consensus um, that, that A plus dog training isn't going to meet that first criteria, but the other two have met all criteria. Um, but do we have a decision yet? Do we, do we know yet who we can contract with? No, we haven't yet incorporated the point rated criteria or the price into our decision. So let's look at the point rated criteria now. Uh, okay, so the A plus dog training, they say they've got, uh, they've been training dogs for over 10 years. They provide a recent client list, um, over 61 months of experience, and they provide those references. Good Boy Doggos, they just give a couple different contracts. They've worked with the Point Ready Police, Police and the Vancouver Police Department for different periods, six and eight, 12 months. And the Deutsche Schefferhund School says they've been in service since January 2016. Please see the business license attached. Now, if we go back and we actually look at the criteria as we listed it, the bid must include a letter of confirmation from an employer, documentation confirming the creation date of your business, or any other documentation that it can attest to your years of experience. They've all provide, used different strategies here, but they've all met those requirements in what they've provided. So we can see, uh, I should make a point here as well that because A plus dog training was found not responsive on that first criteria, they would never actually make it through this point of the evaluation. And, if this were the case, we would not have evaluated their point rated technical criteria. I'm still going through it because I think there's uh, some very valuable lessons to learn about the strategies that they've used here in the point rated criteria. So maybe let's just assume that they did in fact do the other way and they did ask the question early and they got the criteria changed to include Belgian Malinois dogs instead. So now we are evaluating their point rated criteria. So they got 10 five for the 18 months here for good boy and seven for the 46 months for joy for coaches shape. Same thing for the number of dogs sold to law enforcement agencies. They all use some different strategies, uh, but they all provided references that matched with the criteria that we asked for. They sold over 16 dogs from a plus. So that equated to 10 points on our little grid. The good boy doggos sold four dogs. So that equates to three points and the Deutsche Schaefer hunt school sold four dogs to three different agencies. So that equaled seven points if you go back to the points that we can award, oops, wrong document. The points that we can award based on how many dogs you've sold to law enforcement agencies since January 1st, 2013. And this is something that I said that we see, uh, that we see bidders make a lot of times as well. If you don't provide the date, then once we, if we put a criteria in there like, dogs, number of dogs sold since January 1st, 2013. If you say, yeah, we've sold 20 dogs, but you don't provide the dates of when you sold those 20 dogs, even if they were sold since 2013, you're making an assumption then that we, that we know that and that we understand that. So be very clear, especially with dates, uh, when we've provided a date, date range like that. Okay. So let's open the second poll. Which bid scored the highest? So I see some answers coming in and I and and there's a bit of disagreement, but that's cool. Um, if A plus had been found compliant, they would have scored the highest. They got 10 out of 10 on both of those point rated criteria. But the people who are not voting for A, a plus, I totally agree with you um, because if A plus was not compliant, we would not have evaluated them in this section and they would have, you know, they would not have scored anything. Um, 
so that that leaves then we should we should be left with Deutsche Schaeferhand with 14 out of 20 and the good boy dog goes with 8 out of 20. Uh, we said that to be declared responsive you needed to get a minimum of 5 out of 20 so both those uh, both those bids are still responsive bids. Okay so I think we have agreement and consensus on the scores we've awarded uh, but we'll keep going through that but do we have a decision yet on which company to contract with? No, we don't yet because we haven't incorporated price into our decision. So again, uh, normally this would be done separate by separate uh, by separate officers. So once you were done now with your financial evaluation, you'd pack or sorry, with your technical evaluation, you would pack that up and send it back to PSPC. Um, you wouldn't have seen the prices at all yet at this point, um, and PSPC would then combine. Uh, the technical merit scores you awarded with the prices that we received in the bids and we would recommend back to you uh, who met who who uh, who achieved the lowest price per point and therefore should be recommended for contract award okay so let's go through the financial evaluation together now so the a plus dog trainers they came in with a price at a hundred thousand dollars for the 25 dogs Good Boy Doggos was much lower at 62,500, and Dacher Schaeferhand School at 75,000. So let's once again go back to the solicitation documents and look at part four. The basis of selection. So the responsive bid with the lowest evaluated price per point will be recommended for an award of a contract. So do we have that yet? Do we have, and I will open the poll for that section. Once you are ready to select, can I find the next poll? Okay, so which bid should we recommend for contract award? So the points that they received in each of those sections I've laid out as uh, below here. Again, A plus dog trainers would only have been evaluated there if they got the criteria changed. We'll take the, the, the formula that we specified, your total price divided by the points you awarded to arrive at a total price per point. And now we have that value, $5,000 for the A-plus dog trainers, $78,12.50 for the good boy doggos, and $53.57 for the Deutsche Schaefer Hunt School. So it's important to note here that even though good boy doggos had the lowest price overall, they did not have the lowest price per point because they scored quite low on the technical merit, their price per point is in fact higher than the other two bidders, and they would not be recommended for contract award. The Deutsche Schaeferhund School came out with a very low price per point at 5,300, but it's still lower than the A plus dog trainers. Again, as long as they successfully got that criteria changed and were declared responsive, even though they have the highest overall price, they have the lowest price per point. And they would be award. Uh, uh, they would be recommended for contract award in this scenario. Now, if they had not successfully had the, the criteria changed, it would look more like this. They got declared non-responsive early on that first criteria. We go through the whole evaluation. We award points. We get their price quoted, and we combine it with the points that they were awarded to arrive at the cost per point. And Deutsche Schaeferhund School has the lowest cost per point of the responsive bids. Again, A plus dog trainers proposed an alternative good that did not meet mandatory criteria 1.1. If they had followed the correct process for asking questions and had the transparent criteria uh, amended, they would have in fact made it all the way through the criteria 
had 20 out of 20 on the technical evaluation. And even though they had the highest price come in at the lowest cost per point and been recommended for contract award. The good boy doggos had a compliant bid. They had the lowest price overall, but in fact, they had the highest cost per point when we, when we applied the evaluation criteria. Um, I think it's also worth noting the strategy that they used. They had a very simple bid. All they simply did was, was you know, tick off the boxes and agreed that, yeah, these are, these are the goods we provide. Yeah, we meet the criteria um, and signed it saying that everything that they provided in here was truthful. Um, and finally, uh, the Deutsche Schäferhund School, they had a compliant bid, but they used a little bit of ambiguous language. And just to reiterate, uh, I had some colleagues tell me that that ambiguous language in that sample bid there could easily trigger a two hour meeting with lots of discussion and debate about whether or not to accept uh, the criteria that they laid out in that ambiguous language. So, as we went through all those things, I'm hopeful that you're able to learn a little bit about our process and about how we go through things. Um, Specifically, I hope you're able to remember uh, the differences between the mandatory and the point rated criteria. Remember when we use language like must, will, shall, that's a good indication of a mandatory criteria versus should um, is likely an indication of point rated. Remember to pay close attention to the basis of selection. Uh, it's not always the case that we simply accept the lowest price overall bid. Uh, it can be, but it's got to be transparent about the, the rules of the game, how we're going to select the winner. And then finally, the, the process for asking questions. Um, just a reminder that, that my colleagues in the contracting department here change their criteria all the time based on questions from suppliers, from experts in industry. Um, and, and it's our job to respond to your questions. So it can be frustrating the way those questions play out sometimes, I understand that. Um, for instance, we won't always respond directly back to you with a clear answer. We instead have to post an amendment uh, so that everyone can, can uh, benefit from the information that's contained in that answer. Again, transparency, openness, fairness. Um, and we've got to make sure it's translated into English and French as well. Uh, so, you know, it can be frustrating. I understand that to ask questions, but we want your questions. Uh, please ask them. Please contact the contract authority if you're interested in a bid. So Aaron, as those changes are made, when people submit their questions and you realize you might want to modify the bit that's out there, is, is it best for people as they're working through it to just keep referring back to the website for amendments or changes? And yeah, whatever, absolutely. And what happens if someone, like if I've already submitted early and then a, a change is made that might impact my, my bit, what would happen in that case? That's a great, that's a great question. So I'm going to, I'm going to go look at a real live tender and we'll, and we'll, um, uh, we'll talk about how some of that works. So let's just look at great. some active tenders that are out there right now. And just for everybody as well, I found a link. We've done a session um, with Osme before on the buy and sell. So we're going to send out a link to that recording as well when we send out this follow up. So what Aaron's doing now, hopefully you'll get, get a better glimpse at as well if you so choose. Cool. So yeah, so this so this is buy and sell. This is where we publish our tender base, our tenders basically. Any job we have that we want done that's going to be more than twenty five thousand dollars will get posted here on this website. Let's just pick one here. Let's pick Air Charter Services. The page that you see, the tender notice page that you see, will always, always, always have a contact information person listed. This is the person to ask those questions to. This is the person to ask if they're willing to accept the Belgian Malinois dog instead, or if, you know, are you willing to accept dogs that weigh 14 kilograms, not 15 kilograms, or, you know, that sort of thing. This is the person to send those questions to. If you try and call her, she's going to tell you that she needs the question in writing. Um, so you got to email her. Um, in this case, it's Susan Cole. Um, when you email her, what she's going to do is not just respond to you in an email. She's going to publish an amendment to this page. And the amendments appear down here in the solicitation documents section. 
So you can see all these links here are PDF documents. These are the legal requirements. So the first one, amendment number zero, that's the original uh, solicitation document. That's what we were looking at here in our sample, where it's going to have parts one through six, Annex A that, state, that, that gives the statement of work, and Annex C, perhaps, that'll give you the evaluation criteria grid. That's what you find in that in these in this first link here the amendment number if there are additional amendments here and you can see one two three four five these are the changes that they've made so let's just look at the first one i bet it's questions and answers uh they've actually just canceled their yeah so they're amending it and now they've changed the the bid solicitation closing date perfect example of what they might do um, but this is where you're going to see, I don't want to go through them all right now, but this is where you're going to see the questions and answers. So you won't, you won't actually get an email back with the answer to your question. You'll get a, it'll get published here with the text of your question. Uh, obviously they'll remove any identifying information or company information, text of your question and the answer from the contracting authority. So it'll be posted in the document here. Um, you always have an opportunity to amend your bid. All you need to do is just submit again or email Susan and say, hey, I'd like you to please throw out uh, the bid that you've received from me on this date and replace with the new bid that I'm sending now. Um, you can just send in additional pages and say, hey, please replace you know, page 19 and 20 with these new pages, 19, 20, 21. You can, amend, you can amend it in lots of different ways. Just be sure you're very, very clear with them what you're doing and um, that your amended bid is in before the date, uh, the date of closing. They will yeah. often even, if they extend the closing date, they will often even specify in the amendment exactly what they want uh, you to do if you'd like to amend your bid. Okay, great. Um, and then just finally, uh, if you are preparing a bid and you want to stay on top of amendments as they come out, uh, you don't have to check this website every day. There is a feature here. It's these three icons. You can get tender notice updates. So say you're in the middle of preparing your bid for these, this air charter services uh, requirement and you want to make sure that if anybody else is asking questions, you get the answers right away or if they do extend the closing date, you make sure you know about that right away. All you gotta do is click on this little icon here and you'll get uh, set up, you know, tell it your email address and you'll get an email uh, every time there's an additional amendment posted or anytime any change is made on this date. That definitely makes it easier than having to go back and look for additional amendments, that's great. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you're in the middle of writing up that proposal and pulling everything together. That's right. There's a lot, there's a lot you're keeping in your head at that time, right? Yeah. Now, what about, you talked about, you know, external information that wouldn't be included, such as um, links to a video and things like that. If, if it is something that photography helps, can you have um, additional yeah. submission such as that? Absolutely. And the, so this sort of comes down to the individual differences that you might find in any bid, depending on the requirement. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're submitting a bid on video services, chances are we want to have a look at the videos that you've produced already. Uh, and I've usually what I see in that case is that we, we ask that you submit it on a USB key in a hard copy. Okay. Um, they, they tend to shy away from asking for a YouTube link because you can change that link after you've submitted, right? Like you could change right. the video yeah. that's, that's hosted at that link as many times as you want, uh, not knowing what you're actually submitting at the time of closing, right? Correct. Um, so usually they ask for a hard copy of your media, whether it's photography or video or I don't know, you know, um, maybe you're producing like high quality 3D maps of a mine area or something like that, right? Like we wanna, we wanna actually see it. Um, okay. We aren't the most tech savvy in the federal government, so I know there's smarter <laughs> ways of sharing 
I know there's smarter ways of sharing, uh, you know, large digital files than just sending a USB key through the mail. Um, but as of, as of today, that's still generally how I see it when that's uh, when the requirement is something like a video. So we've got a question here coming in, Aaron, from Julia asking if you can elaborate on different trade agreements and how that might af affect bids. Yeah, that's a good question as well. So you can see like this one, for example, has the trade agreement specified, the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. Um, trade agreements uh, basically function the same way law does. They have the same force of law that they do for us and our contracting officers. So anything that's written into a free trade agreement uh, basically means we have to, have to, have to follow it. And it's, and it's, they got some strong, uh, some power behind that with, uh, with the tribunals that they have to, to evaluate it. So basically, uh, the trade agreements set out thresholds and those thresholds, depending on the size of the opportunity will trigger the trade agreement. So for example, Canadian free trade agreement, um, as a threshold of $25,000 saying that any services that are over that amount, I think it's $25,000, might have just gone up to 40, um, must be available to any company across Canada. So if you've got the requirement in Ontario, you can't just limit it to people who are in Ontario. You've got to make sure that people in BC and Nunavut and Northwest Territories and Newfoundland and Labrador all have the same opportunity. So that's what really requires that we post it on our website, you know, on buy and sell .gc .ca and make sure it's available to everyone. Um, what, that all, what, what that means for you guys uh, as suppliers is uh, that the, the size of the opportunity sort of determines your strategy for how you want to approach us. If you're trying to compete on the opportunities that fall under those trade agreements, then you've got to go through our bidding scenario, our big heavy expensive process of submitting a bid on buy and sell .gc .ca. If you're approaching uh, bid and oper uh, work opportunities that are not covered by our supplier arrangements and are tend to be lower dollar value below $25,000, then the relationship is going to be much, much more like a standard, um, a standard business to business relationship, right? Like they are not governed by the trade agreements, so they don't necessarily have to go out and conduct this huge bidding scenario. Um, it could be much more just like, uh, you know, they could just go and get quotes on the phone or, or online from a couple different companies to determine who might have the best price or the best product. Um, yeah, does that, does that sort of answer your question, Julia? Or was there some specific information about the trade agreements that you were looking for? Maybe I can unmute you. Maybe I'll just jump in too, Julie, if you have questions about um, exporting or anything like that and, and trade agreements, you can call into our client service team and we have some export support as well. So just, just to add on to that as well. When trade agreements come in, sometimes there's, there's opportunities there to bid on uh, other government contracts. So. That's a great point. And yeah. um, if, you, if you're on our website, if you go into this for businesses tab, uh, under the find opportunities heading here. Yeah, we have our tenders that are on buy and sell, but we also have a link to other government tender sites. Mm -hmm. So these are all the other jurisdictions that have free trade agreements with the federal government of Canada. Great. Inclu including all the provincial sites, the US sites, the European sites, and our international sites. So I see Aaron, Julia just followed up and said what you the information provided was great and now she's asking what are the requirements for foreign entities and i am mindful of time we're right at 11 o'clock but we'll wrap up with that so if if somebody from the united states is bidding on on one of your contracts is that an option or is that outlined clearly in the bid itself it will yeah so again that comes down to um uh to the specific differences that will be in every tender uh if it's if if it's subject to, to NAFTA or USMCA, then absolutely an American uh, company is uh, eligible to bid. Um, same way that Canadian companies are eligible to bid on opportunities in, uh, you know, from any state or from the federal government in the US. 
uh, when it's over those certain thresholds. I think the threshold for NAFTA is currently at $106,000, so it would need to be a fairly large project. Um, and then for other opportunities, yeah, there's nothing specifically excluding U.S. companies. It's just that when it's that size, we must make it available to U.S. companies unless they specifically state in it, this opportunity is only open to Canadian bidders. And there are, there are some of those out there, some programs that we have. I'm thinking of Innovative Solutions Canada, for example, um, where part of the point of the program is to, to support Canadian business as well. Um, Great. So in those cases, in those cases, uh, yeah, American companies are not necessarily eligible. Perfect. Great. So I'm going to wrap it up. I, I know there's probably a few more questions. So I've shared there for everyone in the chat Aaron's email, and we will be sure to send that out in the follow up as well. So thank you very much. And I'll just and I'll just add really quickly yeah. that this is the first time I've done this session as an online thing. Usually I do it as sort of a classroom, collaborative, walk around and talk to people. Uh, so if, any other participants, if you have any feedback from me, I'm more than happy to uh, to listen and, ta and talk with you about that. Um, so yes, of course, I'll take questions about procurement and uh, tender opportunities, but I'm more than happy to chat just about this session and anything I can do to improve it uh, for future participants. So thank you very much. That's great. Thanks so much, Aaron. Thanks everyone for joining us. So again, watch for the email from uh, Danielle that will go out when the recording is ready. We will, Aaron, send out a survey as well. So if you guys have some thoughts you want to share there, we can share that and pass that on to Aaron. Um, and we look forward to seeing you back here again. Um, hopefully Aaron will do something again in, in February. So yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. For yeah, great. So thanks everyone. Enjoy your day and thanks for joining us. Have a great day.